Hey everybody, this is John O'Bacon and in today's video I'm going to dig into the juicy subject of how to manage people and be a better leader. I'm going to dig into 18 practical recommendations that you can put into practice today. You ready? Let's do it. Alrighty, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. As usual, if you want to stay up to date with the very best in how to build amazing communities and teams inside and outside of businesses, hit that subscribe button and of course tap that cheeky little notification bell to stay up to date with new videos. So today I'm going to be talking about how to manage people and be a better leader. Now let's be honest, there's loads of videos about this on the internet, right? And I've watched a whole bunch of them. And to be honest with you, I find a lot of them are a little bit shit. And the reason why is that so many of them is just someone taking some principles that they've nicked from a business book and kind of waffling through them in a very general and abstract way. And it's often very, very difficult to apply them into practice, into the real world. Well, I want to be the opposite of that. What I'm going to go through is 18, 18 really practical recommendations that you can put into practice today and talk through how you apply them in addition to explaining the principle, okay? Now, as I go through this, I'd like you to go into the comments and share your thoughts, your feedback, share principles that you would recommend that I didn't cover because I think half the value of YouTube can, can be just watching the discussion and kind of engaging with the audience as well. Now, to make this as easy as possible to navigate, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break these 18 recommendations into four sections, okay? The first one is how we understand the environment that we're in, understanding the culture and the teams and the projects and the tools and the workflow and the partners and the community and all of these different elements. If we don't understand our environment, we cannot react to it and therefore be an awesome leader. The second area is about communicating. How do we communicate effectively in your team, to your boss, to your stakeholders, to your colleagues, to, your, to other teams, to community members, to partners, all of these different elements. How do we do that effectively? So that's gonna be the second batch of recommendations. The third batch is gonna be about collaborating. How do you work with people outside of just the communication element, okay? How do you, how do you become a leader and lead a project through to, through to success and, to, through, and through to fruition? And then the fourth area is gonna be around managing. What are the recommendations around managing teams and resources effectively to, to, to drive great results, okay? All right, so our first batch of recommendations here is about understanding. How do we understand the environment that we're in? You know, if you don't understand the, the environment that you're in, then you can't make the right kind of choices to, to trigger the right kind of action. Now think about the greatest leaders that you've ever come into contact with. What is it about them that makes them so good? And I think when you answer that question, you'll realize it's largely because they understand the world that they're in and they're able to react to it in a really effective way that gets really good results. People who can just engage really effectively with marketing, but also with design and also with engineering and with the community and other people. Those are the people we find most inspiring, okay? All right, so my first recommendation here is around spanning cultures. Now, what I mean by this is that in every business there are different cultures. The culture of the marketing team is different to the sales team, to the engineering team, to the product team, to the design team. And then of course you've got ge geographical cultures, the Asia, uh, offices are going to be different to the European offices and the American offices, for example. So one thing that's really important, I think, is to reach out to these different cultures to truly understand them. And the reason why is because when you understand a culture, their norms, their pain points, their you know what what they what they strive for, how they work, what their in jokes are, you know what they're interested in. When you understand those pieces, you can converse more effectively with that culture, and then you become more trusted, okay? How many of you have worked with people, let's say you're in a marketing team, and then you know someone from the sales team kind of comes in and they just seem a little too suave and you know a little too businessy and corporate and you're like, oh, I don't really get them. That's a cultural clash, what's happening there. In the same way that I've met sales folks where they meet up with some engineering staff and they're like, God, all they, can, all they can talk about is this tactical engineering stuff. Our customers don't care about that. That's a culture clash as well. So what I'd recommend you do is make a list of all the different cultures within your community, within your organization, and then schedule a call with one or two members of each, right? And just ask them a ton of questions. Ask them you know, what they're excited about. Ask them what their pain points are. Ask them what their goals for the future are. Ask them what, what challenges they've got today that they'd like to resolve the most. You know, ask them kind of what books they like to read, what YouTube videos they like to watch, and just soak it up and ask them questions when they give you answers and just delve into it and just try to get an understanding of it. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna equip you with, when you then need to deal and work with those different groups, okay? So the next recommendation here is around empathy. Now, a lot of people talk about the importance of empathy and there's no doubt it's critical, right? We always need to be able to understand what people are going through. And I think in many cases, this is 
easier said than done for a couple of different reasons. One is that there's a number of different personality types in the world, right? For example, you can do an Enneagram and it will tell you your dominant personality types. And some of these personality types just are naturally worse at empathy than others, right? Some people are just more naturally empathetic towards other people because that's the way their brain is wired up. So for some people, they have to be intentional. They have to really focus on on, on the empathy kind of approach to really genuinely understand it, whereas to, so to other folks, it just becomes much more naturally, okay? So one of the things I'd encourage you to do is to, you know, when you're having conversations with folks and you're understanding those different cultures that we just talked through, is really focus a lot in on what their challenges are, right? And try to really think through, like, what is it about that challenge that, um, that, that makes it difficult for them? And that's where you'll often be able to generate some empathy. So for example, imagine you're talking to an engineer and the engineer is basically saying, you know, I'm just completely overworked, right? Now, instead of just thinking, well, yeah, we're all overworked. We've all got so much to do. Think, put yourself into their shoes. Look at it. Put your brain into private browsing mode and try to look at it through their eyes, okay? Well, maybe the reason why they're struggling is because the whole business is based upon the products that they're building, okay? And if they get their engineering wrong, then it can result in security defects and people can lose data, for example. Um, so they're being expected to engage in really kind of intellectually complex and draining work, which is writing software. Um, they're under the gun to do it. They don't feel like they're necessarily being able to apply the, the right amount of time for these different pieces. So therefore they feel like they're rushing and that's given them a level of kind of insecurity about whether the work's very good and they're worried about potential consequences down the line. That's the kind of thing that will generate your empathy because then you're like, oh, I totally get where you're coming from. But as I mentioned, it sometimes takes intention to be able to figure that stuff out. Now, the reason why I'm listing this, that side, the monitors on the other side, that's, no, that side, aren't I a pro? The reason why I'm listing this also is no bullshit empathy, is because there are some people who fake empathy. You know, like somebody will say, yeah, I'm just having a really bad day, and they'll be like, oh, how are you? And here's the thing, it's obvious. It's so obvious. Like when people are fake in the way that they react to other people, you can see right through it. I've got a friend of mine and he's an absolutely lovely guy, but he's one of those people where if I bumped into him in the street, I'd be like, hey, how you doing, man? And, he, and a normal person would be like, yeah, I'm good, you know, just out with the family and, you know, work's pretty good and I've been doing this and I've been doing that and you have a very casual conversation. He'll come up to you and he'll be like, Jono, oh, it's so great to see you. Oh, it's, how long has it been? It's been at least a year. Has it been a year? It's at least a year, right? It's been a year. Why don't we see each other more often, okay? How are you doing? How's that new project that you've been working on? You know, people who kind of have that level of just overdoing it, um, a, a term that I used to refer to before I moved to the US as being very American. <laughs> Is that racist? Might be a bit racist. Take that away, okay? But you know, that kind of level of overdoing the reaction to something. Well, th here's the thing, right? People can, people see through that and they, and they think, oh, you're, you're being a little bit much, you're being a little much right now. You're being a little fake. You know, Jimmy Fallon, for example, has been accused of fake laughing over the years, you know, because someone will say something relatively minor and he'll burst into laughter and he'll, you know, the whole, or that whole thing as he's laughing into his fist. So when you're applying empathy, like genuinely, genuinely generate the empathy. Don't fake it, don't pretend because people can see right through it and then that will kill trust. Now, a really, really important thing that I wish more leaders would focus on is understanding the, the urgent and important quadrant, right? Now, this is a principle that was in a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, which honestly I thought was gonna be one of those ridiculous self-help books where you're supposed to walk on hot coals and you know, fall into people's arms and all that kind of nonsense. And it really isn't. It's just a very, very practical book with a series of principles that are really useful. And one of the things that he talks about in the book is that you've kind of got this quadrant, you've got this axis where things that are, um, that are urgent and then things that are important as well, okay? So many of us, we spend most of our time on the things that are both urgent and important, right? So you wake up in the morning and you look at your email, you're like, oh, I gotta do this thing, I gotta respond to this person, I gotta get this report done, I gotta plan for this thing that's happening, you know, next week. Um, but what often happens is that we don't focus enough on the things that are not urgent but are important. And that can be things like 
syncing up with people and having conversations and updating bits of the website, for example, that haven't been touched for a little while or refreshing your materials or kind of spending some time talking to your community members or your customers and things like that. Things that would always be very, very easy to punt uh, to spend time on something that's con considered to be more urgent. Well, one of the things that I've noticed about amazing leaders is that they're able to always make time for the things that are not urgent, but they are important. And there's only one way to do this, right? The first thing you have to do is to sit down and make a list of all the things that you consider to be not urgent, but you'd really like to get to. I'll give you an example of something that um, is on my list right now as I record this video, and this may be fixed by the time you watch this, is I haven't gone and updated uh, the pages on my website about my consulting for a while. I've just been busy with other things and it's like, I've got plenty of business coming in, you know, I don't feel like I really need to do it. But just from a pride of ownership perspective, I, it could do with a refresh, right? They're a little old, I haven't updated them for a while, I'd like to add some video. And I just haven't got around to doing it. So that will be something that will be on my list. Another could be, you know, spending more time, uh, like I say, meeting up with your team or meeting other members of your community. Like forging human relationships and maintaining human, human, good human relationships is a critical element of the things that are not urgent, but they're very, very important. So sit down and make a list of that. And then the critical thing is that you make time for it. Put it in your calendar. I have a very simple view. If it's not on my calendar, it just doesn't exist. It really doesn't, okay? So if it's in the calendar, I'll stick to it and I'll, and I'll focus on it. Do the same thing. You know, what I do now, and I haven't done the consulting pages yet because I've been working on some other stuff, is I have an hour every day in my calendar where I focus on the stuff that is not urgent, but it is important, right? And you've got to force yourself to do it because sometimes you're like, oh, but I really need to reply to that email. I really need to do this thing that's super urgent. You can say, no, it can wait for an hour. I'm going to do this and focus on that. That is going to really help you to focus on on getting um, attention onto the things that other people will be like, wow, did you see that he or she, you know, you, um, they made improvements to this or they, they reached out to me for a, for, a, for a meeting and, you know, they were asking me how I'm doing or we just went and had lunch or whatever it might be. People will be impressed by the fact that you're taking time for those things that are not urgent but are really important, okay? Another area that I think is really important to focus on to be a, a, just a really good leader and a good manager is understanding the power dynamics in your organization. So here's the thing, every room has a power differential, right? I'll give you an example. If you go into a meeting with your boss, right? Um, when you walk into that meeting, you will immediately feel like they've got the power. It's completely natural, it's, human, it's natural human behavior, is that they are the, they've got a level of seniority both in terms of uh, the organizational structure, the social grouping, they're also paying your wages. So therefore you feel that, you, that they've got all the power in the room. And this is especially prevalent for people who are younger in their career and also especially for people in kind of underrepresented groups where there is an additional kind of power differential that's often in play as well. The best thing you can possibly do as a leader is to understand these power differentials, these power dynamics and try to level and normalize them, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, one time I was working with a, a guy, Rick Spencer, who I used to work with at Canonical, and we were in a meeting. There was about 10 people in this, in this particular meeting. And, um, you know, a very kind of energetic bunch of people. And one member of the group made a comment about, you know, the project they were working on that was very, very critical. And the minute he started talking about this, a ton of people rolled their eyes and they all started dogpiling on him because he was a very junior member of the engineering team. And I think a lot of people felt like he was kind of almost being inappropriate, that he was breaking some kind of social convention. And what Rick did, which I really admired, is he said, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let him speak, okay? He's earned the right to share his feedback. He's a member of the team. And it sounds like he's got valuable information to share. So what he did is he immediately leveled the power imbalance that was going on in the room, okay? And I think it's really important that we do that. So to, to be able to reseed that power imbalance, what we need to do is we need to understand where the power exists. And the power doesn't just merely exist in the hierarchy. Just because someone is a SVP or a VP or a director or a, a senior manager or whatever it might be, it doesn't mean that they have all the power. There are many organizations where somebody who's been on the ground floor of the company as a regular kind of awesome independent contributor will have more power in the social structure than people who are more senior up the ranks, you know? I'll give you another example. There was a guy who I used to work with, again, at Canonical, called Colin Watson. And Colin was just like a really just consistently amazing engineer. 
and um, we had many, many managers, kind of, uh, managers, managers, what's that? Managers kind of spin into the company and, and, and they'd own chunks of the project and teams and whatever else. Um, but I, I tell you where the real power lay, it laid in people like Colin, you know? If Colin said we should probably do something, then lots of people would listen, okay? So look where the power is in the organization, but importantly, look where the power is missing or where the, where the imbalance is there. So especially look, for example, if there is uh, unconscious bias playing a role, are women being treated differently, are people of color being treated differently? You obviously wanna, wanna normalize that so people can uh, be treated equally and fairly, but also identify where there are really good people who have great influence and great insight, but they can't get their perspectives through because the power dynamic is stopping them from doing things, you know? There's a lot of people who I've worked with over the course of my career who are amazing people, but they never get listened to because they are further down the ranks in a company that's very, very hierarchical. And it's your job as a leader to bring them up to the surface, to get them the visibility, the oxygen, the light that they deserve to be successful in what they're doing. So look for that. It's really, really important. I guarantee you one thing, if you want to be well-respected as a leader, when you do that to somebody, when you help to get people, break them through that barrier, that power barrier, and they can, they can have a good experience, that builds an incredible amount of loyalty and respect and all that kind of good stuff that they will share with other people. Now, the final one within, um, within the understanding piece here is about finding people that are better than you. Now, this might seem a little obvious, um, but the reason why I'm saying this is because I have met hundreds of people over the years who are, they'll talk a big game about um, you've got to surround yourself with good people and make sure that, you know, um, you empower people to do really great work. But if they personally feel threatened, they will privately push those people to the side. They'll never say it, it'll never be spoken about, and it will often be hidden or it will be shrouded in some kind of way but they feel individually threatened. And the reason for this is because a lot of people in positions of power are very, very insecure about the power that they're in. Now, you're watching this video. By definition, you're interested in leadership. By definition, you're interested in management. So you may be a leader, you may be a manager in your organization, in your community, wherever you are. Think honestly, just in your own head. You don't have to share it with me or share it in the comments or anything like that. But just think, do you feel threatened by people who are better than you? And honestly, on like answer this question honestly. It's, it, in fact, it's not just okay to say yes, then I'd encourage you to say yes if you genuinely feel that way. Because when we understand these limitations, these flaws, uh, then we can manage them, right? And I'll be honest with you, I used to be like this. When I used to work earlier in my career, uh, especially before I started consulting, because I, I kind of got kicked out of me when I became a consultant, I would often feel very threatened about somebody else coming in who's younger, smarter, more effective, and being replaced, you know? And, and, that, and if I'm being honest with you, I probably did push some people to the side unintentionally, and I, I feel bad about that, you know? So we don't wanna do this. What we wanna do is, as a leader, our success is in empowering the success of other people, right? So if, for example, if you're running a community project and you've got people who, who are gonna create content, a couple of community managers, Maybe people are going to be advocates and getting out there on the road and talking about the community. You want people who can do some of these things better than you can, right? There's a reason, for example, why I hire a bookkeeper to do my books. There's a reason why I hire an accountant to do my, my accounts. There's a reason why I hire a gardener to come and do the garden because those people are way better at that than I am. I'll give you an example where people often um, struggle at this at a first level you know, um, when they're leaders and that's in hiring an assistant. You know, when I hired my assistant, I was reluctant to do it for many years because I thought the only person who can possibly manage my calendar is me. I know what's important to me, how much time, those different pieces. And I thought, I, I've got to be the best person at managing my calendar. And then I hired my virtual assistant, right, who came in and started helping me. And I realized immediately, okay, how wrong I was. She is so much better. She's not only more, more responsive and more efficient, but she's just better at it. She knows how to engage with the folks and pick good time slots and consider these things that I would never consider. So really try to break through that insecurity and focus on how you, how you surround yourself with people who are better than you. And if you're worried about where you fit into the mix, remember, as the leader, you are the chef who's pulling all of these different pieces together, okay? 
the comparison here will be the, the celebrity chef who's surrounded by all these amazing sous chefs um, and great wait staff and great interior designers to make the restaurant look good. You know, but a lot of people are gonna still respect you because you're kind of pulling the strings together and making this very successful, okay? So the practical thing to do here is within your project, within your business, whatever it might be, is identify the people who are much better at things than you are, get to know them, build a relationship with them, and help to get them involved in the project and celebrate their successes. Be open and say, you know, you're so much better than me at this. You know, I, for example, say to my clients all the time where they say, well, can I just book a meeting with you directly? And I'll say, I'd really much rather, I'd rather you go through Mindy because she's just way better at this than I am. And it's the God's honest truth, okay? All right, so let's now talk about communicating. Now, this is a super important element of how we, of how we become a great leader. I think 98%, frankly, of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is gonna be communication. It's not just the words that we say, the words that we type, the comments that we make, the calls that we take, the video calls that we get on. It's the tonality, it's the modality, it's the texture of how we communicate. It's our focus on getting things done, it's how natural we are, how social we are. All of this plays a massive role in, in how effective we are as leaders and managers, okay? So these are really, really critical pieces they wanna cover on. The first one, and I think possibly the most important recommendation here, is to be a good listener. Now again, this is one of those kind of business cliches that people often talk about. You've gotta be able to be a good listener. Active listening is really important, but many people suck at it, right? And what I've learned over the years with me is I love to talk. I mean, look at this, I'm talking to, right now, no one, I'm talking to a camera, but <laughs> I'm actually talking to you lovely people, right? I like to talk, I've got ideas that I think are relevant and interesting and hopefully useful to the world. Um, so I have this natural tendency, because I tend to look, talk a lot, to want to talk, right? And when other people are talking, sometimes I just feel this urge, I'm like, oh, I know what I'm gonna say, I know what I wanna say, I know how I can add to this, how I can contribute to this. And part of the reason why I have this natural uh, um, um, kind of you know, proclivity, if it were, towards talking, is I mentioned earlier on about the Enneagram, is that my Enneagram type is, I think it was called a, um, a kind helper or something like that, where I, I'm a service-orientated person. I love delivering service to people. It's one of the reasons why I love being a consultant, right? It's one of the reasons why I put these videos out. I love helping people. Uh, and I'm not saying this in some, you know, virtue signaling, I'm trying to be like a charitable, you know, hero. I genuinely do enjoy spending time helping people. So consequently, when you have that kind of personality, you want to talk a lot, okay? And sometimes the best way of helping is to listen, is to listen to people. So what I've discovered from this, where I have a tendency to be a bit of a gobshite and talk too much, is what you need to do is you need to develop a side of your brain that's monitoring you. Right? And this is kind of an element of stoicism, if you will. Like stoicism is this, um, this philosophy uh, that goes back thousands of years, which is all about managing situations effectively and managing difficult situations. So, you know, just as a little sidebar for stoicism, imagine you go into a meeting with a customer or your boss or whoever it might be, and they're frustrated, they're annoyed, okay? You can feel that, that, that coiled spring. Some people become very defensive, and then sometimes people say things that they, that they didn't want, that they shouldn't say at least. Now, stoicism would train the little brain, in, uh, you, you, the, a voice in your brain to basically say, okay, this is uncomfortable, but what do I want to do to get the best possible outcome here? Instead of reacting to the emotion, how do I make a good decision based upon this, despite that coil spring, despite that frustration that's building inside of me? And what I want you to do is to train the same little voice to be monitoring how much you're talking and how much you're listening, okay? So, um, for example, I was in a call about two weeks ago, and it, it just a company that my wife and I recently invested in, and it's called Coda, and um, we're coming up with all these cool ideas for things that Coda can do, and I realized a couple of minutes in that I've been talking for basically a minute and a half, and I didn't give the, the guy an opportunity to kind of respond. So my little, that little voice in my brain basically said, all right, Bacon, shut up and let them listen. And then I went into probing mode. I was like asking him questions about his perspective. So what's really important is to first of all, train that little voice to monitor how much you're speaking and how much you're listening, but also to get into the habit of asking questions, okay? To channel your inner, you know, late night host, your inner podcast host. And there's a number of questions. I just, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I've got these questions that I actually have on the wall over there above my desk. And these are the questions I will often ask people when I'm doing the active listening, right? So for example, I'll ask them, what's on your mind? I'll ask them, 
you know, they'll respond to that and they'll say, and what else is on your mind? So they'll probe into a, a, another level of detail. I'll ask them, what is the real challenge that's here for you that you're facing? Um, I'll also ask them, like, what do you really want? Um, then I'll ask them, so how can I help? And I'll also ask them, if you're saying yes to something, then what are you saying no to? And another question is, like, what was most useful for you, most useful for you in this discussion? So create your list of questions and then keep asking them and probing and, dis and, dis and discussing. The reason why this is so important is that when people are interested in what we're saying, it builds trust, okay? Uh, it also, you as an active listener, you'll just discover more about a person, you'll understand the culture, their pressures, their concerns, and then that can help you to be more effective, more helpful in the world that they're operating in. All right, so the next recommendation here is to be as transparent as possible. Now, this is a relatively brief one because um, as a general rule, the more transparent people are, the more trust gets built in them, okay? If you are someone who shows up to a meeting and you don't really say anything other than the specific elements of business in there, you don't talk about your ideas, your perspectives, your concerns, your fears, you don't talk about your interests outside of work and things like that, then people don't really have an opportunity to really get to know you, to understand the measure of you as a human being. And one of the great benefits of being transparent is that, you know, when we go to work, when we go to a community, when we go anywhere, you know, that sliver of time is one small element of, of, of our personality. Like I'm making this video, right? And you're gonna make a certain determination on me as a human being from watching this video. Um, but outside of this, you know, I like to drink gin. I listen to heavy metal, I play in metal bands. You know, I'm really into music and movies. I like video games. Um, I like watching different, polit different political sides um, debating with each other in a kind of a respectful way as opposed to bickering with each other. There's all of these different elements of my personality that I try to bring a little bit into the videos that I do and the content that I bring. And I think that helps you to understand me as a human being. If I only ever talked about the business stuff, then I don't think it would resonate as much. So there's two recommendations I want you to focus on here. One is gonna be, let your personality come out, like let it shine, talk about, to the level you're, you're comfortable with, talk about your interests and your hobbies and be vulnerable. Talk about what you're worried about and talk about the fears that you have and be open about your failures and your mistakes. People really, really, really respect that, okay? And if you're ever worried that this is gonna be going against you, just you know, tell that little voice in your, in, in your, in your head to sod off, okay? Because it's wrong, right? The more vulnerable, the more focused we are, the more we share, uh, the better it's gonna be, right? If you listen to my podcast, Conversations with Bacon, I've, I've had a ton of pretty senior people on there who talk very openly, very, you know, with a great level of vulnerability about the challenges that they've faced. But the second thing I'd like to recommend you focus on as well is just in your communication, in the projects that you run and that you manage, again, talk openly about it. Like if there's a failure, right? If someone doesn't ship something in time, for example, instead of, um, instead of zoning in on like what went wrong and all the rest of it, you know, say, well, you know, maybe I can, maybe I could have done a better job here checking in or, you know, were there any other struggles that were going on that caused this? Try to understand this kind of combines a little bit with empathy because that's going to help to create a more comfortable, more fulfilling atmosphere for everybody involved. Okay. All right. So the next recommendation here is the importance of building trust. And this is possibly one of the most important recommendations in this video is that when we have trust with somebody, we have a foundation to our relationship. We can have much deeper, more focused, more honest, more vulnerable conversations with that individual. Okay. Like if you and I met at a conference and we don't really know each other, our conversation is going to be very much kind of everything that's okay to be in the public domain, things about our businesses and our work and our perspectives and other things like that. But if we do trust each other, if we know each other, if we've known each other for a while, if you've shared some things in me and I've, I've kept those things in confidence, then the conversation that we can have at that conference is gonna be much deeper. It's gonna be much more vulnerable. It's gonna be much more uh, personal in, in many ways, okay? And those are the kinds of relationships you want with your team, with your stakeholders, with your boss, with other people. The only way to build trust is to spend time with them. It's to get to know them, it's to offer yourself as an ear, and it's to help people solve their problems, okay? That's how you go about building trust. The reason why I say no BS trust is because one of the worst things that you can do is to their face to be saying, yeah, you know what, you know, I'm here someone you can trust and you can tell me whatever you like, but then if you go and blabber to other people what they've been telling you or, you know, you are nice to them to their face, but then you're talking smack about them behind their back, if you're playing those kinds of political games, then you will generate the opposite. Opposite, you'll be generating a lot of distrust, okay? But 
spend some time, go and spend some time with your team, with other people you work with and build that trust. It can be as simple as, you know, just go and have a coffee with somebody and asking them about their family and asking them about their life and what, what's going on and, you know, encouraging them to loosen up a little bit and confide in you. And then again, treating that confidence with the respect that it so rightly deserves. Now, one area where I think a lot of leaders don't focus enough of their energy on is the importance of being able to tell awesome stories. And I'm not necessarily just talking about, you know, that year that they went to Burning Man and, you know, do you remember when we went to go and see Rammstein and what happened when they brought the flamethrowers out? I'm not talking about those kinds of like fun kind of barroom type stories. I'm talking about the, 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 the role of storytelling and getting people excited and motivated about the work that they're focusing on, about the community they're in, about the mission that they're focusing on, okay? So let me give you an example of this. When I wrote People Powered, uh, the, the goal of that book was, the beginning was to explain the value of communities to people who don't really know anything about it, right? And I, I thought, well, one way to do that is to use a story, because stories are kind of like a vessel that's filled with meaning. You know, when you tell a story to, some, to somebody, there's an underlying premise, there's a principle, there's a moral that's in that story that it's fun to kind of figure out what that is and take it away. It's one of the reasons why fairy tales were so popular years ago is because there was, there was an underlying kind of ethical story that you could take away from it, but it was delivered in a fun package, which is the fairy tale. Now, when I wrote People Powered, I was like, what's the first story gonna be? And I knew instantly what it was gonna be. And what I talked about was, when I was at Canonical, and many of you will have heard this story already, um, um, I'd been at the company for about six months, and um, I got an email from this kid called Abiomi, and he basically said he lived in a rural village in Africa, and um, he loved Ubuntu, which is the, the, the technology that we were building, uh, and Ubuntu is an ancient African word that means humanity towards others, and um, he said he would spend the entire week kind of doing chores around the village and you know, trying to earn some money, he didn't have a computer at home. Um, and then he'd walk on a Saturday morning, he'd walk two hours to his local town, um, to an internet cafe, he'd spend all of the money that he'd earned. He would usually buy around an hour's worth of internet access, or he'd contribute to the Ubuntu community, and then he'd walk two hours back. The first time I read that email, when I got that email years ago, I honestly had like, my, my eyes were welling up. It was such a profound demonstration of the power of community and passion and motivation and feeling part of something that's bigger than you are. So the reason why I put that into that first couple of pages of People Powered is because I think it got across what I could have taken 20 pages to explain. It got it across in a page, you know? And that's the power of stories and the power of storytelling. So whether you are building a new product or whether you are focusing on a activism or a you know, you're trying to become the best business in your area, you want to become the best startup, whatever your vision, your journey is, the one thing that people love about working at companies and in communities is when the work that they do has meaning, right? Dan Ariely, who wrote a book, uh, has written many books in behavioral economics, talks about this guy who was, you know, asked to put together a big, a, a big report for a, a mergers and acquisitions process. And, you know, he was sleeping at the office and spent all of his time focused on it. And then uh, he got an email from his boss basically saying, oh, the, the, the deal's off. We're not going to need your presentation. And he was completely deflated. He'd still enjoyed doing the work, but he, he felt deflated because the work didn't have meaning anymore, okay? So meaning is really, really important how we build amazing businesses and communities and all the rest of it. But the way we emphasize and sell and reinforce that meaning is through stories. It's constantly telling stories about the successes that we're having, the impact that our work has on other people. Too many leaders don't focus enough on this. So really think carefully about like, what are the stories that you can tell? Every week you wanna be telling stories about how the team that you've got, the work that you're doing is having a profound impact on the goals, on the, the audience that you're focusing on, on all those other elements, okay? There's a bunch of books out there that you can read about this that will help you kind of to develop that skill, but it's so, so important. And it will build a tribe of people who will be really passionate about, about your leadership and about the, the impact that you have, okay? Now, it's kind of closely related to what I was just saying about stories is that we want to inspire people and stories are an amazing way to inspire people. Like the story I just told you about the kid in Africa who was contributing to Ubuntu, that's not just a cool demonstration of the power of communities and someone feeling part of something that's bigger than them, but it's an inspirational story. It makes people feel good. It, it makes the hairs in the back of your neck stand and end, right? It's cool. Um, so inspiration, I think, is really amazing. The one thing that bugs me is that sometimes people take inspiration 
to a whole new level where it becomes it becomes cheesy and it becomes awkward and it becomes cliched, right? And you don't want to do that. And often the reason that, that they take that approach is because ego is driving it, okay? I used to work uh, at a foundation called XPRIZE, and XPRIZE is amazing. XPRIZE has these massive incentive competitions to solve major problems in the world. You know, the first XPRIZE that I worked on was the $15 million Global Learning XPRIZE that challenged teams to build an Android tablet app that teaches kids how to read without the aid of a teacher within 18 months. So like really big inspirational challenges like that. And there are many, many people at XPRIZE, and I would include our founder, Peter Diamandis, in this bucket, who were just, they really know how to inspire people. They know how to get people motivated and excited. And of course, they use stories to do that, right? However, wrapped around XPRIZE were a lot of people who were inspired by XPRIZE, who would want to get in on the action, but their inspiration and their approach to inspiration was often cheesy and awkward and cliched and weird and a little desperate. And often it's because it was driven by ego, is that they, they weren't so much interested in, in, in the outcome, in inspiring the outcome, such as the helping the kids to be able to read in Africa because of the Android tablet. What they were more interested in is being seen as the person who's involved with the impact, okay? And this is an incredibly destructive force. The thing about inspiration is inspiration's great when you're focusing on the mission and you're including your team, you're including the community and other people in the mission. So if you go to your team, for example, you want to inspire them around a new project, a new vision that you're working on, get them pumped, get them excited, have the stories, have the inspiration, but don't make it all about you. Make it about what they can do, the impact that they can have, inspire their action, focus the inspiration on them. Don't focus it on you. And when you do that, you won't just become a leader that people will want to follow. You'll be a leader that people want to be supportive of, that will people, people will want to be close to, okay? And one great way to get a sense of what that balance is between you know, how you inspire the group and the vision and the use of stories and all those different pieces is to find some role models who inspire you. Okay, and sometimes those role models don't exist in the business world. I'll give you an example. One for me is Dio. This guy, Ronnie James Dio, may he rest in peace, an amazing musician. He's the guy that invented this sign in metal, okay? Um, I very fortunately got to see him uh, play at a metal festival in Germany called Wacken shortly before he died. He's widely regarded as one of the most just incredible people that's ever been in rock and heavy metal. And, uh, and what part of the reason was that the music was great, like the work that he did was great, but also he was just, he was just his tonality, his approach. He was a, a gentle, a genuine, a kind human being. And I think that's one of the reasons why people didn't just love what he did, they were inspired what he, by, by what he did as well. Another example also, again, with a, with a metal theme, is Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden. Like I've been a fan of Iron Maiden since I was probably nine, eight or nine years old. I went to see them when I was 11. My dad took me to Donington Park to see them, Monsters of Rock Festival, 92. And one of the things that I am inspired by with Bruce is he's not just a, an amazing singer, but he's an airline pilot. He was an Olympic level uh, 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 fencer at, at one point. He's written a bunch of books. He's done a bunch of solo albums. You know, he had um, mouth cancer that he conquered. He's just like, he is just, an incredible entrepreneur. I was very fortunate to interview him for an article that I wrote for, for Forbes once as well. He's just an incredible person. The, and when he inspires people, like when I had that phone call with him, he spent more time talking about me and talking about my perspectives on the world than he was talking about him. He focused his energy on getting me excited about the conversation, getting me excited about the things that he was talking about. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so the third section of recommendations here is gonna be around how to deliver amazing collaboration, okay? How do you work with your team members and other teams and other groups to deliver fantastic results, okay? So the first area that's really critical here is around becoming a really great project leader, okay? Now, leadership to me is not just about having great ideas for how to make the product better or the service better for your customers and your community members and how to get it out to the market and all those different pieces, but it's about converting ideas into action, okay? The kind of leaders that we have that only ever wanna talk about ideas, but then can't get down to the nuts and bolts, sleeves rolled up of getting stuff done, they often will solicit at some point a certain level of derision behind their back. People will think, you know what? 
well, they're all about the great ideas, but ideas are always fun to make, but the real hard work is kind of getting down and delivering those ideas and getting results out of them. And I think, frankly, it's a fairly reasonable criticism to make. So if you want to be a good leader, you can't just be the ideas person. You've got to be able to convert that down into action. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be like, you know, running agile epics and having everything tracking, you know, finite levels of detail. You may have, for example, program management staff that do that. But what you are going to need to be able to do is to say, okay, we've got this big idea. Let's break it down into these four pieces. Let's tie these to particular timelines. Let's figure out who's going to be responsible for delivering these different pieces, what they look like, and managing the overall project to success, okay? Your job as a leader is to pull your resources together and to deliver consistent results. Make sure everybody in your team knows what to do. You've got to be able to operationalize all of that stuff effectively. If you can't do that, then your team really won't know what they're doing. They'll get stuck. They'll be into team bickering and, and problems because people will be kind of treading on each other's toes. It causes all kinds of problems. Now, don't worry if you don't necessarily know a lot about how to do this. The good news is there's tons of information out there on the internet. I might even do something myself, make a video myself about just a simple way of, of, of effectively running a project when you're a manager, okay? So just go out there, do a little bit of digging, read some books, watch a couple of YouTube videos, and you'll figure out the, the core elements of how to do that. But this is so, so important. I think another element to being a, a, an amazing leader is about empowering creativity. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're working on um, a new web page, okay? And you've got a couple of different people involved. The, the programmer who's gonna be building the page for you or the, you know, the web architect, Maybe you've got somebody who's going to be creating the copy and you've got somebody else who's going to be feeding in for how the product's going to look. What you want to do is you want to be able to enable those people to come up with all kinds of new ideas and perspectives and get creative in what we could, we could do to make this, this page look as amazing as possible. The problem with a lot of leaders is that what they'll do is they'll say, okay, I think we should do it this way. And then what that does is it constrains the discussion. It constrains the ideas to a box. It's kind of like me as a musician going into a, a rehearsal room and saying, you know, I want to write a thrash metal song and I want it to be at 240 BPM, okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to constrain the whole band that we can only write a song that's going to be like this really upbeat thrash metal song. Whereas some members of the band may think, well, why don't we start out slow and then we can kind of gradually build the speed up and then we could drop down for a halftime kind of thing and then we could go really fast and you kind of like bounce around and get all creative. So as a leader, one thing that I think is really important to do is realize, this goes back to the power dynamics, that when you say something, other people may think of that as either a directive or as a set of kind of a fence that is wrapped around what you're talking about. And it's really important that you don't do that because you will crush creativity, especially if you're a leader that tends to be, you know, really kind of holding your team accountable. People may may assume that your idea is kind of defining, okay, that's the ballpark that we need to operate in. So what I'd recommend you do is that when you go into meetings where you're having you know, ideation and discussion and brainstorming, is sit back and say, okay, I want you folks to just, I just wanna sit back and watch. Like come up with some ideas and I'll feed in where it makes sense. But just, I wanna watch what you're doing, you know? A good example of this is some, some years ago, um, one of my clients was a company called Endless and they were building a, an operating system designed for developing markets where people could learn educational elements, but also how to code and build software and things like that. And we went into a meeting to talk about one particular product that uh, they were interested in building. And Matt walked into the meeting and he sat at the back of the room. Everybody sat around the table and everybody looked at him as if to say, okay, what do we do, Matt? How do we get started? And he said, I just want you folks to just, don't think about me. Let me, do, I wanna to listen to what you've got all get to say. You've got way better ideas than I do. And they started talking through. And then when they started going down an, an area that didn't make a lot of sense, Matt would then chip in a little bit and maybe pull him a little bit back towards this piece. But what he was doing is he was gently guiding as opposed to forcing and channeling the conversation in a particular direction. That's the way to do it. That's how you enable that kind of creativity. And when you enable creativity in your team members, then the environment feels malleable, it feels fun, it feels engaging because you've got this creative outlet that you, didn't, that you wouldn't ordinarily have if you're working in a company where you're stuck in a booth and you can't make any decisions. Now, one thing you may have noticed throughout this video is that I'm often referring to the things that some leaders do wrong and then inverting those things to form the recommendations. And this is actually a practice that I do all the time. I regularly, pretty much every week, will say to myself, 
Like, what can I do to improve? Like, what are my weaknesses that I can strengthen? And when I was designing this video, I was thinking, what are the things that people aren't doing well as effective leaders? What are the things I see people complaining about, for example, in teams about their leaders? And then how do we invert them and get better results? And one of the major problems I've seen with a lot of leaders is they just don't delegate enough, right? So they've got a set of resources, they've got a set of things that they need to do, and they don't utilize their resources, the people and tools and whatever else, effectively to generate the best kind of outcome. And that really is, frankly, your whole job as a leader, is to have a set of resources, effectively understand, work with them and manage them, and generate a really good outcome, okay? So delegation's really, really critical. I gave an example of this earlier on with myself. You know, like when I hired my assistant, I didn't think anybody else could possibly manage my calendar, and I was wrong. She's way better at it than I am, you know? Another example with my assistant was, you know, I put a podcast out called Conversations with Bacon, and it's kind of complicated in how I put it out there. You know, I've got to upload the file to my site, and then, you know, I create a blog post which generates the RSS feed, and then I create a video, and then that gets uploaded to YouTube. I break it into snippets that then go up on the feed as well as onto YouTube, and then the social media gets scheduled, all of these different pieces. And I thought, there's no possible way that she's going to be able to navigate all of these complexities, right? This is no... This is no, certainly wasn't back then and certainly isn't now, was no criticism of her intellect. It was more, this is a pretty complicated set of things that it's going to take forever for her to be able to figure out. But what I realized was that if I took the time to systematize that, to write it up into the document and provide some clear instruction, she can do it. In fact, what does she do? She took it on and she immediately started killing it. And now all of my podcasting is done by her and I can take that off my plate. So delegation is super critical, but I think the key is that we have to take time to set our teams up for success to be able to do it well. So for example, use my assistant as an example again. When I first hired her, I put together a handbook of all of my elements to how my business operates from, you know, um, my business address and which airlines I like to fly on and my preferences in terms of my scheduling, all those different pieces. And I made updating that handbook her responsibility. So for example, when I did the podcasting piece, I just went and added that into the handbook. But I knew from those early stages that I needed to be clear and give her clear instructions to make her job as easy as possible. Otherwise the delegation would never be successful. The problem with a lot of leaders is what they do is they say, okay, I need Simon to do this particular thing. Simon doesn't do a very good job of it because Simon doesn't have the, the necessary instruction and, and support that he needs. And therefore the leader thinks, oh, the only person who can do these things is me, therefore I'm not gonna delegate. And that's a ridiculous premise to have, don't do that. Because then what happens is the leader gets so filled up with all of the things they have to do, you know, whether it comes to managing the team and doing these individual pieces, they never have any spare time. And what does that eat into? It eats into the things that are not urgent, but are important. The building the relationships, the building trust, the getting to know different cultures, all the different things that we've talked about in this video. So this is why delegation is so critical. Every task that you delegate opens up more time that you can spend for the rest of these things, okay? So what I'd recommend you do is sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and write down all of the things that you hate doing, okay? The things that you don't like doing, the things that take too much time and that you would love to get off your plate. And then also write down the top five of these that you wanna delegate first. And then think about how you go about systematizing this. Do you put it into a handbook? Do you provide a set of simple steps that your, that your team member can go through to do those pieces? Do you do some hands-on training? Nine times out of 10, you can delegate th things effectively with those kinds of measures in place, okay? But really, I'd strongly encourage you to do this. It might seem like a lot of work at first, and it is a lot of work at first, but then you're buying so much time that you can focus on all these other elements that are gonna make you an amazing leader. Now, when you go through that delegation exercise and you manage to claw back some time that you can use for something else, because now your team member's doing those tasks, one of the most valuable uses of that time is gonna be providing feedback. If there's one um, comment that I've heard repeatedly with teams that I work with or with my clients at previous companies that I've worked with, with my friends who talk about this, is they never get enough feedback and validation and input from their bosses from their leaders, from their stakeholders. Um, they're always clawing to try and get that kind of feedback. And the reason why they want the feedback in many cases, because they're nervous about making a decision 
and then the decision goes through and then at a later date the leader's unhappy about that and it causes a whole kind of problem right and then they're scrambling last minute to make changes because the leader doesn't like whatever they're doing you know many of you will have been in a situation where you had to prepare a report or a presentation or an update or something for a, another leader and then right at the last minute they say i don't like this and then we're all scrambling to try and get it fixed okay it's a terrible situation to be in so what's really important is that when your team asks you for feedback you've got to provide it you've got to get in there and do it and often you've got a billion other things that seem to be more important but it's really important to be responsive to those requests for feedback because your team are then going to know that they can rely on you to guide them in the right direction. It's also, frankly, going to help to identify some blind spots and some problems that you don't want to manifest later on, okay? But the other thing that I'd recommend beyond people just asking you for feedback and you providing it is that you volunteer feedback when you're not asked to, right? And I don't mean this in a micromanaging kind of like domineering way. What I mean by this is, for example, I did this yesterday, I think it was, with one of my clients, they're putting together a survey and um, I had a call with the guy who's building the survey and he was just giving me an update about what they're planning on doing. He was sharing a few concerns about the survey and I said to him, I was like, well, you know, if you want, I can go and take a look at it and provide some feedback if you want. And he's like, oh, that'd be cool. And he, he was always gonna say, oh, that'd be cool. You know, he wasn't gonna say, no, I don't want your feedback. <laughs> But what I did is I went into the Google Doc and I left some comments and then they ended up rewiring a big chunk of, this, of the survey based on some of the recommendations I, me uh, I made. And it's not because I'm necessarily any smarter than anyone else. It was just another way of looking at the same particular problem, okay? So, but I, I volunteered that feedback. He didn't request it from me. And now I guarantee you he's gone away thinking, oh, it's cool, like Jono is looking for my success right? And because he volunteered to kind of come in and help out with that, which is absolutely the case, okay? So volunteering your feedback as a leader is really, really important. And sometimes that can be just going into a Google Doc and leaving a couple of comments. The key thing about feedback, and a friend of mine, um, Liz, who's an executive coach, she said, and I forget exactly how she, she phrased it, she said, sometimes some people want you to be Gandhi and sometimes some people want you to be Rambo, okay? So sometimes you need to go in and provide feedback that's going to be, you know, really focused about making improvements and highlighting weaknesses that need to be strengthened and the usual businessy like i don't agree with this i think we should fix this that can be better this can be better this is too long all that kind of stuff but sometimes especially when people are tired they're demotivated they're having some personal issues sometimes you've got to tune the feedback to just making them feel good right you just got to say you know what i think what you're doing is awesome even if privately you're like this kind of sucks they need they need some support, right? They don't need that kind of Rambo-like like feedback on that particular day. So this gets back to the understanding piece. Sniff out and understand what their psychological state is, where they are in the project, and then make sure you go and apply the right kind of feedback. As a general rule, what I like to do is to say, yeah, this is great, this could do some work, but this is also great, this could do some work. It's not so much one of those shit sandwiches that people talk about, it's more an alternation between <laughs> You know, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And it's not bad, it's, this is how we can refine and improve it, okay? All right, so now we're into the fourth section, and this is managing. I appreciate the fact that you're watching with me right now. I know this is a long video, but I really wanted to squeeze as much value into this as I could. So this is all about how do you manage projects and teams and things like that as effectively as possible. Now, the first recommendation here is about being mimic worthy. And you're probably thinking, what on earth are you talking about baking? Well, there's an interesting psychological um, kind of behavioral element in human beings that we tend to mimic our leaders, um, but we mimic their behavioral patterns and their norms. So for example, if you've got an aggressive, despotic, nasty, you know, combative leader, then often the people who immediately surround that leader will mimic that kind of behavior because that's what they believe they need to do to get ahead. Uh, and then that will have an impact on their team members and that will have an impact on their team members. And it tends to soften up as you go down the ranks, but it creates a culture of aggression, of, uh, uh, of political infighting, um, you know, of kind of, of fiefdoms, if you will. But conversely, if you've got a leader who is kind, who's collaborative, who is uh, inspirational and supportive and, you know, gets that kind of power dynamic balance so everybody's got an opportunity to be successful, again, those kinds of personality traits tend to be mimicked. So it doesn't take and Einstein to probably figure out at this point, but when I say be mimic worthy, what I mean is that you demonstrate those very positive personality elements so your team members, so your colleagues will mimic those elements in you too, okay? Now, 
This is important for two reasons. First of all, if you do this and if you act as a kind, all the elements that I've talked about throughout this video, you're kind, you're compassionate, you're caring, you're, you're focused, you provide good feedback, you understand different cultures, all those different elements, you will help your, your team, your colleagues to just be better at what they do because they'll mimic those principles, okay? And then that will encourage people to talk about the best way of, of kind of implementing those kinds of principles and just being great at what they do. But secondly, and possibly even more importantly, it just sets the culture of the company. You know, a culture is not a thing that can be dictated. You can't say, the culture of our company will be these five particular things. It doesn't work that way. The culture is decided by the group, okay? In the same way that right now, in the US, I couldn't go out onto the street and run down the street naked, you know? First of all, I think it's illegal, but secondly, culturally, even if it was legal, culturally, it would just be weird. People don't do that. Society is dictated, not ex explicitly by stating this, that you generally don't run around the street naked. Like, that's just how we've kind of figured out how we work and live together. So in, the company, in a company, the culture is defined by the norms, the perspectives, the way people communicate and engage with each, with each other. So when you set the right kind of example, it infuses that into the culture, and that's why it's really critical. Another really critical thing to focus on as a great leader here is to always stay in touch with people. And this is a lot harder than it may seem, okay? I'm a good example of someone who's actually pretty bad at doing this, in that I'm very fortunate and I've got I've got so many friends and I, and I feel blessed by this. People I've met over the years at different conferences, at gigs, you know, going on vacation, in different places. I just tend to make friends with people because I just, I like people. I'm an optimist. I've always been an optimist. Um, and we'll, we'll hang out, we'll have a great time, we'll exchange phone numbers and Facebook and all the rest of it. And, we'll, and I primarily will see what people are up to on Facebook and social media and things like that. But in terms of getting on a phone with them, and having a conversation and seeing how they're doing, I'm terrible at it, okay? And it's not that I don't care, it's that I'm often so busy and I forget, and I, I gotta be intentional about it. And it's something that I'm actively working on and saying, you know what, I'm just gonna call somebody and see how they're doing, out the blue. A friend of mine, Dustin Kirkland, did this. He just called me out the blue and I saw my phone ring, I was like, it's Dustin, I hope he's all right, you know? And I thought something was probably wrong. And he's like, nah, man, I just thought I'd see how you're doing, how's the family? And I love that. And the thing about great leaders is that great leaders just do this naturally. They will reach out to their teams and just say, hey, do you want to go and grab a coffee or just grab lunch and just hang out? And what I love about when people do this and when I've myself done it, I thought you should do this, Jono, is that the conversation is often very rarely about work. It often starts out with how are your family doing? You know, how are things going? Like, what have you been up to? What's exciting for you? And then we'll kind of weave it back through to the work. But when you do this, it builds the trust. It builds the, the confidence. It helps you to um, solicit feedback and input where people can kind of be a little looser and a little bit more straight talking with people. So one thing I'd recommend you do as a leader is do what I'm trying to do right now, which is I'll basically pick five people each week and I'll say, I'm gonna just reach out to them and see if they wanna just catch up. And even if it's just half an hour on the phone or meeting up for a coffee or grabbing lunch, whatever, but just be intentional about doing it. You should definitely do this with your team members, with your boss, with your stakeholders, with your colleagues, like you know your immediate peers. Always make a point of doing this at least every week. This falls into that, it's not, in, it's not urgent, but it is important bucket that we talked about earlier on. All right, so our penultimate uh, recommendation here is to watch and validate. And what I mean by this is, Again, I'm gonna go back to what some leaders don't do. One of the biggest criticisms that I often hear from people about their leaders is they just don't validate them enough. You know, they don't let them know if they're on the right track enough. And this is something that's very personal to me because I experienced this with a boss that I had once. Many years ago when I worked for a company, obviously this person's name is not gonna be stated, right? I don't believe in going around talking smack about people, but you know, this guy's a, a good dude, okay? Uh, but what he's not good at doing, he's not good at people management, okay? He's an amazing technology person, but not good at people management. Well, certainly wasn't bad then, maybe he's a lot better now. But I worked, worked for him with a bunch of other people and he never, ever gave me any kind of feedback on, and validation. In many cases, he would say, you know, I want you to do this. He would often talk about things that we needed to focus on and improve. Um, and in my um, end of year performance reviews, he would always say, you know, I'm very happy to have you on the team and you're doing a great job. But week to week, 
I never got any, you know, hey, John, I just saw what you did and I thought that was really good. And, you know, uh, thanks so much for stepping in in that meeting. And I thought you made some good points here. And look, I wasn't looking for, um, you know, just a, an endless train of compliments. Of course not. And I'm sure many of you wouldn't look for that either. I mean, compliments are nice, but I don't, I'm not dining out on them. But what people generally need to know is that they're on the right track. And the thing is, if you don't provide validation to your team members, uh, if you don't inform them that they're on the right track, and the majority of the discussion is all about improvements and refinements and, and optimizing things, it's very easy to get into a mindset that you're not good enough. And that's when paranoia can set in, and that's when depression can set in, that's when burnout can set in. So we want to avoid those kinds of situations happening. So what's really important here is to regularly deliver validation. It's to regularly just say, hey, I just wanted to say, you know, that's, you did a great job, you know? And it literally takes seconds to do this, right? It takes seconds to say, you know, thank you so much for doing that. That was really cool, okay? And it's just about it, it being intentional. Now, don't fake it. Don't, don't say someone's doing a great job when they're not. Because if, if, again, if you get rumbled for that, then people will be like, well, I don't trust that I was doing a good job because I knew that he or she lied the previous time. But when someone is doing a good job and when you're happy with what they're doing, let them know about it. It's better to overthank people than to underthank people, okay? But to be able to validate someone, you need to be able to see what they're doing, okay? You need, need, to, be able to, to, you need to be able to observe um, the work that they're doing in a way that, that you can understand it, you can see what's going on. And this poses a question, right? Well, what if you've got a team of 10 people? How can you possibly see all the different bits of work that, are peop that, that people are doing so you can then go out and validate them? Well, this leads to our last recommendation in this video, and that is about reporting upwards and downwards, okay? Now, when it comes to reporting progress, let's be honest, we all hate rec reporting. It's, it's, it's busy work, you know, writing things up and generating graphs and spreadsheets and all that kind of, no one enjoys writing reports. I don't think so anyway. If you enjoy writing reports, write it in the comments because I, I like to bottle you and understand your brain and how it works. But the first element of reporting is gonna be having your team provide updates to you on how they're doing and what, what work they've been focusing on because not only will that appraise you of the work that's going on, but then that provides an opportunity, remember, to deliver the validation that we talked about earlier on, okay? So make sure that there's a simple, crisp way in which people can provide reporting into you. Now, one thing that I would always recommend here is that where possible, you have a 30 minute call each week with members of your team. Uh, if you've got too many team members and you can't make that happen, then you should ask your team members to always provide just a quick email summary at the end of each week of some work that's going on. But you should make sure that you catch up with your team members at least one-on-one -on -one for 30 minutes, at least once every two weeks. There are people who I know who never have time on the phone with their managers, with their, with their, with their leaders, and as I mentioned earlier on, staying in touch is really, really critical. It doesn't just help that person feel connected, but also it's an opportunity for you as a leader to deliver that kind of validation where they can get off that call and they can feel great. Like, oh yeah, I got off the phone with Jono and he, he loved what I did, that was awesome. I, I'm, I'm feeling in a good place about my job. This validation piece is so important, okay? But also what's important is that you communicate upwards to your management, to your superiors, to your stakeholders about the work that you're doing as well. The general recommendation here is that you create an email summary report that goes out at least once every two weeks uh, to your senior stakeholders. And you basically say, like, what have we accomplished in the last couple of weeks? What are some trends that we're seeing? Interesting things that we're observing? Some high fives, you can say, these are some people who've done amazing work, so we can go and thank them. You talk a little bit about uh, some concerns you may be having, like, oh, we're not seeing the right kind of traction here, there, or, or the other place, and then what are you focusing on in the next couple of weeks? This is a technique that I learned from a guy called Martin Mikos, who was the CEO of HackerOne, he used to be the CEO of, uh, of, of MySQL. It's a really fabulous way of keeping your stakeholders, stakeholders, stakeholders up to date, but then you can also, of course, use that so you can be updated from your team, and then you can apply that kind of validation. Alrighty, so I know this was a long video. I really appreciate you sticking through to the end. I know there was a lot of content in this. I hope it was useful. Be sure to give this video a like if you found it useful. It really helps my videos kind of get a little bit more visibility in the old YouTube algorithm. And of course, hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. Go and leave your thoughts in the comments and I'll see you on the other side. See ya.